Born in Boston in 1809, died in Baltimore in 1849, American writer Edgar Allan Poe is one of the world's greatest crime and horror authors. His influence on literature extends far beyond the grave, and he's credited with inventing the detective and science fiction genres. Poe's gruesome and tormented stories reflect an equally tormented life. One of the first Victorians to try and earn a living as a writer, his daring career choice ruined his relationships. He died destitute despite literary acclaim. His most significant works include The Pit and the Pendulum, The Fall of the House of Usher, Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Telltale Heart and The Raven. Poe created some of the most distinctive female characters in the history of fiction and is famously quoted as saying that the most melancholy and poetical topic in the world is the death of a beautiful woman. Poe's women, either they're already dead or they're going to die or they know they're going to die and then they do. The woman has to die for there to be a story. I tried at one point to figure out the kinds of women that he was looking for in his life and it seemed as though about half of them were motherly types and then the other half seemed to be the sisterly types. I think Poe rather fears women because they die so easily. He is drawn and also repelled by this idea that he's going to be abandoned yet again. As a crime writer, I'm greatly influenced by Poe and fascinated by how his private life fed into his work. Both were pitted by the loss of all the women he loved. Throughout his life, Poe was embroiled with at least a dozen women, but I'm particularly interested in his tormented relationships with four key women. Virginia, his young wife, Eliza, his dead mother, Sarah Helen, a spiritualist poet he nearly married, and Francis, the darling of New York's 1840s literary scene. As if cursed, Poe was rejected or bereaved by all of them. <laughs> For me, reading Poe's work, it's so obvious he's trying to reanimate these women, constantly exploring the hinterland between life and death, striving to keep these women alive. In the excitement of my opium dreams, I would call aloud upon her name during the silence of the night or among the sheltered recesses of the glens by day, as if through the wild eagerness, the solemn passion, the consuming ardor of my longing for the departed, I could restore her to the pathway she had abandoned. Could it be forever upon the earth? When Edgar Allan Poe was writing in the early 19th century, America was gripped by Puritan ethics, slavery, rampant disease and poverty. These turbulent times would erupt into civil war, accompanied by another revolution in literature. Poe was a pioneer in America's romantic movement, which rejected religious fanaticism. He reinterpreted the horror and romance of Gothic literature with his psychological exploration of death and madness. He satisfied a public which craved his gory and macabre stories. Poe got inside his readers' heads like no one else and produced work which ensured his posthumous fame in media he couldn't have envisaged. Yes, I've actually built, you know, several of those torture and horror devices that Poe described in his tales. The pit and the pendulum. That's a thriller, isn't it? Well, I certainly look forward to seeing them. Imagine building those things. A very curious hobby. It's more than a hobby. I first read Poe when I was about 12, and I loved the goriness and the darkness of him. But I write in a form that he invented, and reading him now as a writer, technically, if you want to know how to send shivers up the spine of a reader or make them afraid to fall asleep, then Poe's your man. Poe's horror stories terrified his readers, and his detective fiction was so gripping that people assumed he must have criminal tendencies. A visionary thinker, Poe pushed the boundaries of fiction in a way that has influenced writers ever since. Agatha Christie, influenced by Poe. Charles Dickens, influenced by Poe. Walt Whitman, influenced by Poe. Herman Melville, totally influenced by Poe. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, everything he wrote was Poe. Jules Verne, 
total rip-off of Poe. Like most giants of Victorian-era literature, Poe was a man, but he was surrounded by a coterie of women who exerted powerful influences on his storytelling. By delving into letters, journals, poetry and prose written by Poe and his women, I want to uncover how they became female archetypes that repeatedly occur in his writing. The mother figure, the unobtainable icon and the virginal maiden. And because all great mysteries begin with finding a corpse, I shall begin Poe's story in the final days before his bizarre death. It's 1849 and Poe is 40 years old. He's just had a failed suicide attempt and his reputation is in the gutter. His health is failing, he's not looking after himself and he looks terrible. On a trip to find work, Poe ends up in Baltimore's rough Docklands. It's a city in the midst of social upheaval, a magnet for runaway slaves and impoverished European immigrants. It's a wild town and the last place Poe is seen alive is at this saloon, where he goes on his final drinking binge. When he came in, he had a drink. I think there was more to it than just a drink. It was an opium and heroin bar. Because it's right next to the docks, isn't it? It was. They did do drugs out of here. They did Shanghai men for the clipper ships. I don't think I would have liked to live here back then. Would you have drunk here back then? Well, I probably would have had to be a prostitute. <laughs> so. He'd actually been missing for a couple of days when he was found here. How do you think a drunk would have fared on the streets of Baltimore in that time? Probably he would have just been mugged for money, kicked around and just left. But if he was that drunk and if he was a stone cold alcoholic and had blackouts, God knows where he would have wound up. On October the 3rd, 1849, Poe is found in the streets of Baltimore. He's delirious. He's in great distress and in immediate need of assistance. Poe will never be coherent again long enough to explain how he came to be in this dire condition. Bizarrely, is wearing someone else's clothes. Poe is taken to hospital, where he dies four days later on October the 7th, 1849. He's just 40 years old. He's said to have died from congestion of the brain, a common euphemism for alcohol abuse. The actual cause of his death is never confirmed. Thank heaven, the crisis, the danger has passed, and the lingering illness is over at last, and the fever called living is conquered at last. The sickness, the nausea, the pitiless pain have ceased with the fever that maddened my brain, with the fever called living. It burned in my brain. Despite his many loves and literary admirers, Poe dies penniless, childless, alone and desperate. What could have happened in his life to make death so welcome? To find out why he passes away in such pitiful circumstances, I'm going to look back at his tragic life, exhuming his most significant relationships to see why his heart and his fiction grew so dark. I'm going right back to his youth, two decades earlier, to the prime of his life when he should have had everything to live for. It's 1828 and Edgar Allan Poe is 19 years old. He's already suffered a lot of misery and heartache. Orphaned as a toddler, he's fostered by John and Francis Allen. During his childhood, they spent time in Britain, where Poe was taught Latin and French and read the classics of European literature. As a young man, his relationship with his foster father, John Allen, is fractious. Poe is insecure. He picks fights, drinks and gambles. But he adores his foster mother, Frances. After she dies, John Allen cuts him off without a penny. At the time, he's enrolled at West Point Military Academy in New York where his talent for poetry exceeds his talent as an officer. He's discharged within a year and leaves with massive debts. Homeless and destitute, he ends up at this house in Baltimore with his only blood relatives, his Aunt Maria Clem and his two cousins. For the first time since being orphaned, Poe experiences a real sense of belonging, 
and he becomes particularly attached to his young cousin, Virginia Clem. We grew up together, yet differently we grew. I ill of health and buried in gloom. She agile, graceful, and overflowing with energy. Hers the ramble on the hillside, mine the studies of the cloister. I living within my own heart and addicted body and soul to the most intense and painful meditation. She roaming carelessly through life with no thought of the shadows in her path or the silent flight of the raven-winged hours. Virginia was apparently a very charming young lady. Everyone that met her was just enthralled with her, with her beauty, with her manners, and they said you couldn't help but to fall in love with her. Virginia's considerable charms have the same effect on her cousin Edgar, but he doesn't realize the depths of his feelings for her until he nearly loses her. While away from the family home to find work, Poe receives a letter which makes him confront his feelings. A cousin, Nielsen Poe, is offering to take Virginia into his home and raise her as a proper lady. So Maria Clem writes this letter to Edgar asking, what should I do? And this is the first time that Poe expresses affection for Virginia. Poe writes a desperate letter to Maria Clem, telling her that if Nielsen Poe takes over guardianship of Virginia and the household is split up, he will kill himself. My dearest auntie, I am blinded with tears while writing this letter. I have no wish to live another hour. You well know how little I am able to bear up under the pressure of grief. I love, you know I love Virginia passionately, devotedly. I cannot express in words the fervent devotion I feel towards my dear little cousin, my own darling. All my thoughts are occupied with the supposition that both you and she will prefer to go with Niels and Poe. Poe's plea to his Aunt Clem works, and she declines Nielsen Poe's generous offer. Poe gets to keep his precious family together. In 1836, he marries Virginia. He is 27, and she is 13. From a modern perspective, it's easy to suspect Poe of the ultimate taboo. But in the 1830s, marriage between cousins is perfectly legal. And because the life expectancy of women is only 40, 13 is considered old enough. I think in many ways he married her to, to stop her from marrying somebody else, to stop her from growing up. He wanted to keep her just as she was, and he did. There's no reason to think that their union was at all consummated. I don't think that Poe's relationship with Virginia was like that. We do know that they went to Petersburg on their honeymoon, and their bedroom suite only had one bed, so they're at least in the same bed there, but we don't have absolute proof when or if they consummated their marriage. But if we look to stories like Eleonora, it seems to indicate that they did have a passionate love affair. We sat, locked in each other's embrace, beneath the serpent-like trees, and looked down within the water of the river of silence at our images therein. We had drawn the god Eros from that wave. Ever with thee I wish to roam. Dearest, my life is thine. Give me a cottage for my home and a rich old cypress vine. And oh, the tranquil hours we'll spend, never wishing that others may see. Perfect ease we'll enjoy, without thinking to lend ourselves to the world and its glee. Ever peaceful and blissful we'll be. She just idolized and adored him. And Edgar and his wife and mother-in-law just formed this little trio that escaped the whole world. They focused on each other and each other's cares, and even when Edgar was poor, could barely afford to feed himself, he made sure she had a piano and sometimes a harp to play. He loved to hear her sing and make music. He would play the flute along with her. The mother-in-law would sing along. They had little concerts together at night. But the newlywed situation is far from idyllic. To support his family, Poe searches for any kind of paid work, from teaching to bricklaying. 
but jobs are scarce in 1830s Baltimore and he's knocked back every time. The Poe family in this time period, they were starving. Uh, sometimes Maria Clem and Virginia would go out with a basket and ask for donations. Many people did that. Uh, Edgar uh, applied for several positions. Nothing ever came of that. They were starving. They were starving. Poe was writing poetry and not making any money, but yet, yet, despite this poverty, Poe began his literary career here as a short story writer. This was Poe's bedroom, and it was here that he began to write. My baptismal name is Ajayas. That of my family I will not mention. Yet there are no towers in the land more time-honored than my gloomy, gray, hereditary halls. The recollections of my earliest years are connected with that chamber and with its volumes. Herein was I born. Poe's first short story, Berenice, from 1835, is a surreal tale of love, death, and madness about a man's obsession with his cousin. When she returns from the dead after a prolonged illness, he rips out her teeth. It's a daring and original tale, flouting all the conventions of the day. Poe's decision to become a professional writer was unheard of at the time. Fiction just wasn't a money-making proposition. Rich people would pay a publisher to publish their book, or all their family and friends would have to promise to buy a copy before it came out. But here is Poe with no money, no means of support, deciding to do this full time. And that's suddenly possible because of magazines. Suddenly, there is a market for fiction, and the whole process becomes democratised and professionalised. One of Poe's aesthetic principles was that the ideal length of time to have a reader read something you'd written would be like maybe 20 minutes or half an hour because you could have the reader completely under your control, that the reader wouldn't be thinking about anything else, um, wouldn't be putting a novel down to, to go take a walk or, or eat a meal or something, would just be completely absorbed. He is such a deeply interesting psychological writer, and so much of what he writes exposes his own thought processes that that, I think, was a bit of a turning point in... in in the evolution of the short story, the people saw all kinds of possibilities, not just for telling a tale, but actually going into the interpretation of the human psyche and finding out what makes us do the things we do. Men have called me mad, but the question is not yet settled. Whether madness is or is not the loftiest intelligence, whether much that is glorious, whether all that is profound, does not spring from the disease of thought they who dream by day are cognizant of many things which escape those who dream only by night. For a writer as sensitive as Poe, the 1830s are fruitful years to delve into the mind. Victorian scientists are making discoveries that cast doubt on the claims of the Bible and its reassuring notion of an afterlife. As the promise of paradise fades, the moment of death becomes terrifying. Death's inevitability is made even more frightening by the indiscriminate spread of wasting diseases like cholera and tuberculosis. Medicine is not yet advanced enough to explain or treat symptoms of lingering illnesses which could be mistaken for death, and sometimes are. The shallowest breathing of tubercular lungs, the comatose sleep of typhus, or the suspension of movement by stroke and paralysis. Expressing the most common fears of his precarious times, Poe's stories find a receptive audience. He taps into primal human phobias, including the ancient fear of being buried alive. To be buried while alive is beyond question the most terrific of these extremes which has ever fallen to the lot of mere mortality, that it has frequently very frequently so fallen will scarcely be denied by those who think. The boundaries which divide life from death are at best shadowy and vague. Who shall say where the one ends and where the other begins? For Poe, I think the end point is often 
a recognition that one can't fully understand intellectually the circumstances of death. So rather than have some vision of an afterlife, Poe really views the end of life as the, the extinction of consciousness, the end of all things. And that's probably what scared him more than anything. I once again struggled to cry aloud. A long, wild, and continuous shriek resounded through the realms of the subterranean night as he whispered me of a violated grave, of a disfigured body enshrouded, yet still breathing, still palpitating, still alive. alive. His audience was interested in gore and sensation, and so if he wrote about those things, he would make a hit, make a sensation, um, become more popular, become more successful, make a name for himself. And to some extent, I think that might be what he believed. Um, but I think it was also haunted by um, disease and death. Um, it was a topic he couldn't let alone. She had seen that the finger of death was upon her bosom. She had been made perfect in loveliness, only to On the chair lay a razor besmeared with blood. On the hearth were two or three long and thick tresses of gray human hair, also dabbled in blood, and seeming to have been pulled out by Upon the bed there lay a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, detestable putrescence. He doesn't pull any punches when it comes to death, suffering, torture. And it wasn't just for titillation. Poe's object was less frightening people than, than getting the fear out of himself and somewhere else. It, it's very much the equivalent of whistling past a graveyard. He is there to be as scary as possible to prove that he is not scared. And of course, it proves nothing of the sort. Poe's magazine stories receive no literary praise, but they are enjoyed by the public. With no copyright laws yet in place for this new profession, he earns little money, but this doesn't deter him. He tries to earn cash and recognition by entering writing competitions, and eventually he secures a job as the editor of a New York journal, where he busies himself with reviews of other people's work. But Poe drinks on the job and publishes spiteful criticism of his contemporaries' writing. A flashy succession of ill-conceived and miserably executed literary productions, each more silly than its predecessor. The only thing noticeable was the peevishness of the writer, the only thing that left an absolute and irreparable mental leprosy, rendering it a question whether he ever would or could again accomplish anything which should be worthy the attention of people not positively rabid. It's an incredibly stupid thing to do. The publishing world is small and incestuous and Post soon makes enemies. <laughs> life has also taken a turn for the worst at home. Poe and Virginia have been married for six years and Virginia's in the front parlor playing the piano and singing and suddenly she's racked by violent coughing and she brings up blood. It's the first sign of the TB that will kill her. They move to this small country cottage, partly for the good air and what is ironically now one of the busiest thoroughfares in the whole of the Bronx. It was very small. This was the parlor room, and this is where the Poe family spent their time. Virginia spent a lot of time in bed because she was sick throughout the whole time. It's very warm downstairs rather than upstairs. This is why Virginia was moved downstairs, but she was still cold. So uh, when Edgar Allan Poe was in West Point, he kept the cloak that they give you. And this is the same cloak that he wrapped Virginia in to keep her warm. And they also had a cat. They named her Katerina because it was a girl. Mm -hmm. And she would also snuggle with the cat. Mm -hmm. It's very sad, but this is when Edgar Allan Poe's works started getting more emotional. This is how he wrote Annabelle Lee, Eula Loom. It, it brought out the, the most emotional part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabelle Lee. <coughs> with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee. In that time period, if you had tuberculosis, that was a death sentence. You did not survive that. It was the disease of the lungs. And many times people would just choke and drown in their own blood. Sometimes it would be very sudden. Sometimes it would linger. Because Virginia was so young, she didn't just die. <coughs> she 
she was sort of young enough to sort of fight the disease for five years. Sometimes she'd get worse, <coughs> and it felt like she was about to die. He said he prepared for her funeral. He was prepared for her death. Then she'd get better. So he thought that she was cured, and he became optimistic and looked forward to happy life together. Then she got worse, then she got better. He, f he said it felt like she was dying over and over again. Each time I felt all the agonies of her death, and at each accession of the disorder, I loved her more dearly and clung to her. I became insane with long intervals of horrible sanity. Poe is living a double life. By day, he's the editor of a popular journal, but as darkness falls, he becomes the night nurse of his sick wife as Virginia battles her painful illness. For three long years, he listens to Virginia's cough or her silence. Alcohol and writing are the only outlets for his suffering. He writes compulsively, channeling his emotional turmoil into his work. These are his most productive and creative years, in which he composes works that will later be lauded as the most quintessentially poor. Looking upward, I surveyed the ceiling of my prison. A very singular figure riveted my whole attention. It was the painted figure of time. Save that in lieu of a scythe, he held a huge pendulum, such as we see on antique clocks. A slight noise attracted my notice, and looking to the floor, I saw several enormous rats traversing it. They had issued from the well which lay just within view to my right. While I gazed, they came up in troops, hurriedly, with ravenous eyes, allured by the scent of the meat. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? You will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. In 1845, Poe writes and publishes his masterpiece, The Raven. It's filled with detail, metaphor, and reference to Virginia's decline. It's a cruel twist of fate that the greatest turmoil of his adult life is also the catalyst for his greatest achievement. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. This fashionably melancholy poem finally earns Poe the critical recognition he craves. But with Virginia perpetually reanimating from the brink of death, <laughs> his success couldn't be more ill-timed or more welcome. He is propelled into overnight stardom, a sensation among New York's literati. He finds himself in great demand to recite. Women love him. They attend his readings in droves. Deep into that darkness, peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortals ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. I think Poe was seen as this incredibly entertaining and dark, brooding, but also very original talent by this very elite, almost untouchable group of literary personages. Among his swooning admirers, the most influential is the glittering socialite and poet Frances Sargent Osgood. Nearly the same age as Poe, she has two children and an unhappy marriage. She is a successful writer, earning a good living from her highly respected poetry. Osgood is one of those rare poets who really understood the medium of print and recognized that she could appeal to people by developing a kind of coquettish persona, where she would give as much as she wanted but then take away, and appear to be somewhat um, childlike, fairy-like, um, evasive in a way that would have appealed to men in particular. Thou shouldst be a beauteous bird, flying at her lightest word, nestling near her silken zone, like a gem on beauty's throne. 
In one anecdote, while she was listening to Poe recite, she was looking up at him adoringly um, with her dark eyes uh, and clearly was enthralled and appeared to everyone in the room to be absolutely taken with Poe's demeanor. Finally, when she did meet him, she said, I liked him very much. With his proud and beautiful head erect, his dark eyes flashing with the electric light of feeling and of thought. A peculiar and inimitable blending of sweetness and hauteur in his expression and manner. He greeted me, calmly, gravely, almost coldly yet, with so marked an earnestness, I could not help being deeply impressed by it. My soul from our first meeting burned with fires it had never before known. As I hoped to live, her talents were of no common order. Her powers of mind were gigantic. I felt this, and in many matters became her pupil. At this point, Poe is the editor of the newly created Broadway Journal. Poe and Osgood court each other through its pages. He publishes their poems side by side. Osgood may sign her poems Violet Vane, but everyone knows it's her. I know a noble heart that beats for one it loves how wildly well. I only know for whom it beats, but I must never tell, never tell. Hush, hark, how echo soft repletes. Ah, never tell. Beloved, Amid the earnest woes that crowd around my earthly path, drear path, alas, where grows not even one lonely rose, my soul at least a solace hath in dreams of thee, and therein knows an Eden of bland repose. The evidence is actually rather thin that Poe and Osgood had a physical relationship, but they both had reputations that could be ratcheted up based on their relationship to one another. Poe, who had only published a couple of thin volumes of poetry, recognized that she had a kind of literary cachet that he would like to feed into. It's quite possible that they had a sexual relationship. Certainly, the scandalmongers said so. Um, it's, it's difficult to know whether or not they did. My thinking is probably they didn't, because Poe liked to hear himself talk a lot more than he liked anything else. And so I suspect that his the sexuality was mostly verbal. Back at home, Poe's wife Virginia is still struggling with tuberculosis. Virginia knows about her husband's correspondence with Francis Osgood, and she tolerates the relationship, <coughs> believing it to be platonic. <coughs> she considers Osgood a family friend and a sobering influence for Poe, personally and professionally. There were various points at which Poe, who had gone on benders, of course, throughout his career, tried to dry out. And this was probably one of those times. During that period, Poe wasn't drinking. So my guess is that he felt the need to maintain a certain air of propriety around Osgood. <coughs> and that was one of the reasons why Virginia actually approved of this relationship. You have to credit Virginia because she put up with a lot of nonsense. Poe was gone a lot. He would try to sell his stories. And then there was the, the vicious gossip that Virginia would hear about Poe having an affair with this person, Poe flirting with this lady, Poe spending time with this person over here. Poe's reputation as a drunk has already been exacerbated by his mean-spirited literary criticism. His enemies are now only too happy to also brand him a scandalous philanderer. At the height of their entanglement, when Osgood is supposed to be estranged from her husband, she gives birth to a baby girl, and a malicious rumour circulates that Poe is the father. The baby dies within a few months, and Osgood never confirms who the father is. The damage to herself and Poe is already done. Angry at the wagging tongues, Osgood publishes a scathing retort in the form of a poem. A whisper woke the air. A soft light tone and low, yet barbed with shame and woe. Yet might it perish there, nor further go. 
Ah me, a quick and eager ear caught up the little meaning sound. Another voice had breathed it clear, and so it wanders round from ear to lip, from lip to ear. Poe and Osgood are in the sights of New York's most vicious gossip monger, Elizabeth Ellett. A published playwright and historian, she's a jealous rival of Osgood, both professionally and romantically. She also starts to court Poe through her poetry, but Poe dismisses her out of hand publicly. And then goadingly, he prints her poems next to Osgood's for comparison. It's a massive blunder. Slighted, Ellett seeks revenge. She sends poison pen letters to the now gravely ill Virginia, accusing Poe and Osgood of all sorts of debauchery. <coughs> Already extremely fragile, Virginia is traumatised. In a society where reputation is everything, there is only one possible outcome. Poe and Osgood stop seeing each other. They decided that the relationship was going to be damaging to both of them. It had reached a kind of tipping point in terms of the mores of 19th century readers and even their own contemporaries. After that point, around 1846, they no longer saw one another. Poe loses the woman who represents the type of intellectual recognition he craves. Francis Sergeant Osgood is his unobtainable icon, and she has gone. He's also on the threshold of the shattering loss of his virginal maiden. Poe leaves his job at the Broadway Journal to care for Virginia in her terminal months. He says that on her deathbed, Virginia blames the osgood Ellet scandal for hastening her death. <coughs> removed from the world with its sin and care and the tattling of many tongues. Love alone shall heal my weakened lungs. After fighting tuberculosis for five long years, Virginia dies in the freezing winter of 1847. She is just 24. How shall the burial rite be read? the solemn song be sung, the requiem for the loveliest dead that ever died so young. But she is gone above with young hope at her side, and I am drunk with love of the dead who is my bride. Coming here and seeing how small and modest the house is, you have a real sense of what an intimate family they must have been, and how Maria Clem and Virginia really gave him that stability and intimacy and sense of belonging that he'd craved all his life. So it must have been devastating to lose Virginia and how fundamentally that must have shifted his entire world. After her death, he said he just couldn't live another year without her. He was just having a breakdown. The newspapers reported that he would be dead soon too. In the excitement of my opium dreams, I would call aloud upon her name during the silence of the night or among the sheltered recesses of the glens by day, as if through the wild eagerness, the solemn passion, the consuming ardor of my longing for the departed, I could restore her to the pathway she had abandoned. Oh, could it be forever upon the earth? Virginia's death sends Poe spiraling out of control. He's back on the drink and starts taking the powerful opiate drug laudanum. I feel that a shadow gathers over my brain and I mistrust the perfect sanity of the record. After Virginia's death, he had gone into a real bad physical and mental decline and one of the caregivers who took care of him said to him, unless you find a woman who's strong and will help guide your life, I'm afraid you're going to have a sudden death. So he, in 1848, a year after Virginia died, he had kind of set out to find the strong woman. In his drug-addled grief, Poe pursues several women, but the most receptive to his frantic advances is the eccentric poet Sarah Helen Whitman. He's caught a glimpse of her outside her house in Providence, Rhode Island, as his carriage passes by. In his Desperate need for a new wife, he hounds Whitman with romantic verse. I saw thee once, 
once only. It was July midnight, and from out a full-orbed moon that, like thine own soul soaring, sought a precipitate pathway up through heaven, there fell a silvery silken veil of light, clad all in white upon a violet bank. I saw thee half reclining. Whitman and Poe have a lot in common. She's widowed, childless, an established writer, and she's interested in the same themes as Poe. Death, the afterlife, the Gothic. He had heard that she was a, a lady of eccentricity and sorrows. He thought, aha, that's my thing, eccentricity and sorrows. She is six years older than Poe, unusual for the times when men were expected to be with younger women. Well known around town as a clairvoyant, Whitman holds weekly seances. She studies mesmerism and healing and claims she can cure headaches with her hands. She wore what was considered pagan dress, you know, in this Victorian time. She liked to wear a lot of scarves and shawls. They would fall off as she walked down the sidewalk. But there was the joke that her friends all had to walk behind her and pick up her scarves and her veils that she was always dropping. She wasn't the most conventional person, shall we say. Suddenly, a chill wind leapt through its woven harmonies. All its silver chords were snapped, like a wind harps by the breeze. Graves closed round my path of life. The beautiful had fled. Pale shadows wandered by my side. She was using ether, and they said a faint odor of ether would waft behind her as she went down the street with her scarves and veils, but this wasn't unheard of at that time. Ether was considered to have medicinal value. She wore a little coffin around her neck. I don't know if she had that as a memento mori, because she felt as though she herself had only a short period of time to live. She, she had a heart condition, at least she believed it. And so she was always kind of reminding herself of, of the shortness of life, and I think the coffin fit that. Poe courts Whitman here at the Athenaeum Library, an acceptable public place to meet for this rather unconventional couple. From the very start, this relationship is characterized by conflicting hopes and motives. Poe's looking for a substitute mother, someone who can tether him and look after him and Whitman is involved in a mad romantic adventure with a charismatic younger man. The magic of a lovely form and woman, the necromancy of female gracefulness, was always a power which I had found it impossible to resist. But here was grace personified, incarnate, the beau ideal of my wildest and most enthusiastic visions. I resolved in my mind a thousand schemes by which I might obtain the elder lady. Poe came to Providence five or six times to visit her, and each time he came, he urged her and urged her very strongly to marry him. He wouldn't accept no for the answer which she had already told him after the first time. And the second thing he would do quite often is to appear at her house after drinking, which was the one thing that she said she couldn't, she could not marry him if he kept drinking. And I have read that she thought that sleeping with him would kill her. Had I youth and health and beauty, I would live for you and die with you. Now, were I to allow myself to love you, I could only enjoy one bright, brief hour of rapture, and then die. <sighs> she was afraid that because of her heart condition, that having normal sexual relations would probably do her in. And he said, don't worry, I won't make demands on you. At your feet, if you so willed it, I would cast from me forever all merely human desire, and clothe myself in the glory of a pure, calm, and unexacting affection. 
I would comfort you, soothe you, tranquilize you, my love. The courtship went on for three months, and it seems longer than that because it was so dramatic. You know, there were scenes, there was much weeping and begging and um, misunderstandings and some drunkenness. But he somehow, after all that, managed to convince her to accept a conditional engagement. And she said, all right, if you will stop drinking, and if my mother will approve of it, I will marry you. So how they became engaged was that he kind of wore her down, I think. But Whitman's mother doesn't approve. She's aware of Poe's reputation as a drunken philanderer. She forces her daughter and Poe to sign a contract. If they marry, Whitman will be cut off from the family estate for good. She said she would rather see her daughter dead than married to Poe, and she said it in front of Poe. Um, he, he called her the old devil, by the way. <laughs> if only he hadn't wanted to marry her, they would have been very good friends, I think. She said he had given charm to her lonely existence. I knew from the first that our engagement was a most imprudent one. Oh, I clearly foresaw all the perils and penalties to which it would expose us. The union was prevented by circumstances over which I had no control. Whitman loves Poe, but the threat of being cut off is compounded by the fact that he won't stop drinking despite her ultimatum. Reluctantly, she breaks off the engagement and ends their relationship. Poe, meanwhile, is distraught. His sense of loss is wildly disproportionate. He barely knows this woman, and this is a theme that comes up again and again in his correspondence. He attempts suicide, he gets incredibly depressed, and it's always to do with the loss of a woman. After Whitman's rejection, Poe tumbles into a pit of despair from which he never recovers. I was but a child, groping, benighted. How had I deserved to be so cursed with the removal of my beloved? I saw, I felt, I knew that I was deeply, madly, irrevocably in love. But ere long, the heaven of this pure affection became darkened in gloom and horror and grief swept over it in clouds. Throughout his life, what Post sought from women was unconditional love, acceptance and recognition, but they always slipped from his grasp. Sarah Helen, the mother figure he hoped would save him. Francis, the unobtainable icon he pined for. Virginia, the pure maiden he adored. All these women embody the single most inspiring and absent influence on Poe's life. The woman who died at the same age and of the same disease as his wife, Virginia. The woman who represents all his archetypes in one. His mother, Eliza Poe. To understand how deeply the loss of his mother affected Poe, I'm going right back to the beginning, nearly 40 years to his infancy. It's 1811, Poe is two years old and living in Richmond with his mother Eliza, his brother Henry and his sister Rosalie. His mother is a 24-year-old actress. She's successful and popular, but acting is still seen as an unsavoury profession. It's regarded as just one step away from prostitution. At this time, not even performing Shakespeare is acceptable. Young men will do it if they come to it. By cock, they are to blame. Eliza has never known anything else except acting and stands firm against the slurs of treading the boards. She becomes a leading actress, so much in demand that during her short life she plays over 200 different roles. This is the last place standing in Richmond, Virginia, where Eliza is known to have performed. Once a theatre, it's now a Mason's Lodge. To please has been my never-ceasing aim, and to effect this end, to me you find what various character has been assigned. A miss just in her teens, a rigid nurse, a boy to please old maids. Oh, Lud, tis worse. Sometimes I have appeared a ghost, tis true. But yet I'm flesh and blood, as well as you.
the first imprinting of a female figure in Poe's mind is his mother. He must have perceived her as a kind of fairy-like figure on stage surrounded by bright lights, this wonderful vision. Eliza was described as being very beautiful and charming, and one reviewer in Norfolk, Virginia, said she was the handsomest woman that he'd ever seen. Eliza was born in England, and when she came to the States, she was performing in cities where acting had only been legal for a few years. Edgar is born into a moralistic society that shuns him for most of his early life. He doesn't just have one parent who's on the stage, but two. His father, David Poe, is also an actor, but unlike Edgar's mother, not a very good one. Poe's father has a reputation for being an actor who erupts at bad reviews, threatening critics with violence. He's touchy and perverse. Time and again, he bites the hand that feeds him. He's known to have just completely forgotten his lines on stage. He suffered from a paralyzing case of stage fright. He was so bad, he got hissed off the stage on a few occasions. He got booed so bad, he started threatening the audience from the stage. It's partly because he considers himself too good to be an actor, and partly because he drinks. David Poe disappears for good not long after baby Edgar is born. And Eliza is left to raise her young children on her own. On my word, tis the father's son. Oh, I'll swear tis a very pretty boy. She manages to look after the infants and continues to work. I saw him run after a gilded butterfly, and when he caught it... But in Edgar's second year, she catches the killer disease, TB. She was continuing to act until within a few months of her death. But then she was unable to perform anymore to bring in money to support her family. But because she was such a beloved actress, local families started volunteering their time. Society ladies, even who wouldn't be caught dead so associated with an actress, started visiting her, bringing her meals, caring for her. It was said to be quite the fashion of the day for society ladies to care for Mrs. Poe. <coughs> Knowing that her death is imminent, Eliza cuts off a lock of her hair as a keepsake for little Edgar. She dies in December 1811. After her burial, Edgar is separated from his siblings and fostered by the wealthy John and Francis Allen. Frances Allen is one of the society ladies who had cared for Eliza Poe in her last days. Edgar grows to love his foster mother, but John Allen never officially adopts him, insisting that he keep the name Poe. Poe sort of had a chip on his shoulder. Other kids looked down upon him. They mocked him because he was an orphan and because he was the son of an actress, which was not much better than being the son of a prostitute. So Poe had to work extra hard he went all out to prove that he was better than everyone around him. When there was a big competition, he was 15 years old. And the students in his academy set out to see who could swim the farthest in the James River. He outlasted them all. He went six miles against the tidal currents. So Paul always wanted to place himself at the top of the class, do best in his studies, be the best athlete. He represented his academy in boxing and track. But he also developed a bit of a temper and a hostility to people who are looking down upon him. And there are descriptions of him getting into fights with other children. But as an adult, he defiantly said that no Earl was ever more proud of his earldom than I was to be the son of an actress. And he attributed his talents to her. To my mother, because I feel that in the heavens above, the angels whispering to one another can find among their burning terms of love, none so devotional as that of mother. All his adult life, wherever Poe goes, to each new town or city, the first thing he does is visit the library. He's searching for any articles or reviews that mention his mother. One of the theories about Poe's recurring motif of the beautiful young woman dying is that his mother died so early in his life that he never really understood that she was dead, that he never got past that death that he always had that feeling that she would come back to him. Poe writes quite a lot about reanimation and the idea of reanimation. And I think that perhaps on some level, it is because he saw his mother die so often on stage 
Uh, she was always playing Juliet and Ophelia, and to a child who is not even three years old, the idea that she can be dead and then she'll come back again and then she can die again, it must have made it very difficult to understand that she was never coming back. His mother is the most powerful inspiration possible for Poe. It's the inciting incident, the death he fears after which all great stories can start. But nothing in Poe stays dead for long. He yearns for his mother to haunt him. Throughout his life, Poe searches for women to fill the void his mother left. And in his work, he reanimates elements of the mother he never knew, bringing her back from the dead again and again. She who had been dead once again stirred. And save that the eyelids were yet pressed heavily together, and that the bandages and draperies of the grave still imparted their charnel character to the figure. I might have dreamed that she had indeed shaken off utterly the fetters of death. I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry, at first muffled and broken, like the sobbing of a child, and then swiftly rising into one long, loud, continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman. Many people were orphaned at a young age in the 19th century. What happened to Poe is not unique, but what is unique is how Poe channeled his experience. The death of a beautiful woman was his greatest fear, and one he knew was shared by a lot of people at the time. And if you're writing about the things that haunt you, then those are the things that are going to be genuinely haunting to a reader. Poe was terrified of losing the woman close to him, it was a cataclysmic grief he lived through time and time again, but his artistry and skill is in writing about those terrors so resonantly that we still feel them when we read his work today. And then, then all is mystery and terror and a tale which should not be told, disease. A fatal disease fell like the simoon upon her frame, and even while I gazed upon her, the spirit of change swept over her, pervading her mind, her habits, and her character, and, in a manner the most subtle and terrible, disturbing even the identity of her person, alas. The destroyer came and went, and the victim, where was she? I knew her not, or knew her no longer as Berenice. My love, she sleeps. Oh, may her sleep as it is lasting so be deep. Soft may the worms about her creep. Some tomb from out whose sounding door she ne'er shall force an echo more. Thrilling to think, poor child of sin, it was the dead who groaned within. We have the story of Electra Records coming up next here on BBC4 this evening as our music night offering kicks off in just a few moments, followed by the fourth week of our singer-songwriter programmes.